Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're gonna talk about the part two of my nuclear series video, Nuclear Energy Paradox. So let's dive deep into it. So I'm assuming you have watched my yesterday's video about India's nuclear plan. So let's understand the greater context around it. So the dream, uh, what is our dream? Well, here's the reality of it, is that our world and our technology is becoming hungry. Meaning at this point in time, there is a good probability that some of you have a mobile phone that requires a power uh, brick that is around 100 watt. So you have to understand, our hunger for energy is growing exponentially. So we have reached a point where we have realized uh, is that current fossil fuel sources is not safe nor cheap enough. Now, safe part, uh, again, depending on what is your context or depending how highly you value global warming, uh, it's still unsafe. Now, like, let's assume you are a country who does not give a damn about uh, global warming. You will still give a damn about it being unsafe. What does unsafe mean here? Well, unsafe simply means, let's say India goes YOLO on coal. Now, first few years, we're going to have super easy time. Why? Because easily exploitable coal uh, seams would be used and we're going to have cheap coal. We're going to have a lot of energy. Everything's fine. Everything's dandy. Here's the deal. As we consume that easy to access coal we have to go through harder to access coal price per ton of that coal will start to go up and then slowly and slowly over time it will reach a point where it's too goddamn expensive and it will happen with uh, oil and gas also and in case of oil and gas not most nations have it so they have to import it and USA got a very big bitch slap with this uh, during oil embargo where OPEC literally choked the oil flow to USA so there is a serious penalty with fossil fuel everybody understands this aspect thoroughly so it's not safe and not to mention it's not cheap enough meaning the more we consume it the harder it becomes to consume more and then it becomes like per ton prices goes up uh, in a dollar per um, kilowatt hour goes up so we there was a prediction early days that renewable at some point will cross over yeah that happened so we have realized very early on that we cannot rely on fossil fuel. Fossil fuel was more of a, uh, like, you know, a crux where it was like, you know, we are learning to run on it and then we had our own tools for it. So we known this, we were looking for this alternative for very long time. Again, oil embargo kind of era and global warming kind of set a fire under our eyes where there we have to be like, okay, we have to solve this now. So in principle, on paper, nuclear power will solve all our issue. Meaning, uh, many people will talk about, hey, uh, nuclear energy is very well tested with uh, army systems and they have been working. There is more than enough reactor. There is more than enough years or in some cases, decades of experience to tangibly say, yeah, it is here. It is real. We got this. We understand this. It's a base load power 24 into 7. You do not have to worry about anything else. It's a known solvable system. So basically, on paper, nuclear can solve all our needs and it can scale up infinitely. So not infinitely as in like in India's case, we're supposed to have enough reserve of thorium for around 200 uh, years of energy consumption while exp uh, exponentially growing on paper. And same with USA and all that. So <clears throat> reality is on paper, nuclear solves all our issues. So that's the dream. Now let's understand some historical context why this dream did not happen even though it started in 50s. Well, uh, the first uh, OOPS event happened in Three Mile Island on 28 March 1979. Now what about the damage done? It was very mild. The reactor was destroyed but the release to environment was very minimal and it was like a bypass of a radioactive water and some other uh, reactants were released but nothing major, nothing very serious in terms of damage done to the environment, minor inconveniences, almost like some people got extra x-ray or some people took a fly in Concord, things of that nature. It was not like, you know, harmful, lethal, you're gonna die, nothing like that. So harm was very low. However, this showed us the first problem with nuclear technology. It had the worst PR talk, meaning nobody knew anything about anything. What is happening? Does the plant manager know? No. What is happening? Does the energy, nuclear safety commission knows? Uh, does the president know? Does the people working there know? Do everybody communicates with everybody properly? Do, do you need to evacuate the place? So uh, precautions were taken. So it was a literally, um, as time went on, it got worse and worse simply because of miscommunication. So it fundamentally showed us a very real reality where humans are limited in terms of direct communication of nuclear technology. And a uh, lot to mention to give you, it horrified the public because one thing came out after the investigation report is that uh, scientists and engineers, best of the brightest, because be mindful, this was a national incident. So USA got their best and the brightest there. So it was not like the only plant people. They could not figure out uh, the hydrogen that was being created. Will it gonna go boom or it's gonna uh, mix with oxygen and turn to water again? 
it was like literally at that point in time nation's best and brightest was called and they could not just answer the simple question it took them time to figure this out whether what will happen with that hydrogen like there was a serious tension that it could actually go boom and uh, again if you look into the communication hazard that happened it was like dude don't say this don't do this don't 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 it was just like a real mess of communication so it exposed the first weakness in nuclear it's not simple it's very fundamentally complex situation so it was a minor oops event but it did show one serious vulnerability and why did that incident happen yeah because a key had a tag that tag was covering a red light yeah that's how it happened a, a one reactor got fried simply because a tag covered a pump that if somebody had noticed that light they would have like okay we had to take care of it it could have been easily minor inconvenience to oops one reactor went away and not to mention nuclear image was permanently destroyed because of that pr issue so this is the first slap again you may be like okay first we'll we'll learn then set, second bit slap happened that is chernobyl 26 april 1986 so not very far from uh, 79 and uh, why did this happen well lot of things actually led to it so primary reason why it happened cost cutting so it was not a mention of like it's gonna happen uh, like you know it will never happen only this circumstance no it was like the design was so sloppy that sooner or later is gonna happen and be mindful uh pre preemptive boom events have already happened in ussr there was a recorded history of that design going almost like almost going boom so it was not a matter of time it was a like a sooner or later somebody is gonna reach a point where this event will happen so cost cutting was really bad and again uh, this is the easiest way to understand the difference between ussr and usa usa had a reactor meltdown but reactor never breached containment they had a meltdown it went kaboom and there was no uh, vessel to handle it there was no pressure vessel it's cheaper so cost cutting literally made it bad now here's the so far is just a oops event something bad happened okay now because of ussr ego they did not take care uh, quickly meaning can this have been handled very efficiently very quickly absolutely but the politics slowed down it so much that it expanded the hazard to exponentially larger area meaning like that could have uh, things that could have been sorted in uh, hours took days and again, watch the Chernobyl series, like how long it took people to just agree, okay, something bad happened. Compare that to uh, like, you know, Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island is like, okay, something is bad, uh, red alert first, worry about it after later. Which again, with nuclear, you should follow that. And again, Chernobyl is a stark reminder that what happens if you do not. So that happened. Now here's the deal. After these two events, people took nuclear very seriously. Nuclear power plants being cancelled. A uh, lot of nuclear plants went through extensive security modification. Lot of training. Lot of price went up of nuclear power plants. Even many power plants have been uh, reworked while they are being constructed just to make sure that there is no oops event happening. So a lot of price hike happened. And for a few years, everything was quiet. Nobody was like, everything was like fine. People were like going back to their normal life. Nobody was worrying about it. Until this happened, this boom event. Now this happened in Fukushima, uh, 11 March, 2011. So uh, not that far ago. And uh, here's the interesting part. Now, why did this happen? Again, Japanese ego and uh, the backup generator flooded. Now, this part personally uh, boils my blood. I have no idea how the heck the world is convinced and uh, be it people talking about sodium reactors, be people talking about a small modular reactor or news anchors talking about it. It's like, oh, you can just insert control rod and reactor shuts down. This happened after that. There is a fundamental misunderstanding. There is no off in nuclear reactor. Once you quote unquote turn off, all you do is in, reduces his energy output that could be megawatts of thermal output to lower uh, energy state. You do not turn it off. It does not become ambient temperature. It still is a radioactive decaying mess. It's hot. It is hot as hell. And some scenarios it could require cooling for 48 hours if you are lucky. Some designs cooling for one week before it's like actually off. And that's what happened here. Uh, something bad happened. Earthquake tsunami happened okay emergency systems like i got your back turns off the reactor okay then why did it happen afterwards well here's the deal when you turn it off you cut power to the plant now you no longer have power now why do you need power here's the deal water in a nuclear reactor is not a natural state it will turn to steam or worst case scenario it will turn into hydrogen and oxygen because of thermolysis so fundamentally we have to put a lot of water there as in put water under a lot of pressure so we can circulate it so water does not boil and we can remove heat that requires a lot of pressure very very 
idiotically high pressure and that much pressure is not even a fire truck pressure that is like a you need megawatts of power in order to drive pumps that are powerful enough to push enough water in the reactor to cool it down so you can throw all the water from a fire truck it will not do anything it will just bounce back uh, because again steam pressure would be so high so you need a uh, pressure pumps and uh, why japanese ego i said uh, nuclear safety people again they are a group of people internationally recognized they travel around they look into things and they have fresh eyes the, everybody else checks everybody else's work and they find flaws and they fix it before boom event happens before this happened so they noticed in japan it's like hey uh, i get it you are short does not mean the tsunami would be short please increase the height of your flood wall that was exponentially small there's like no it not never never be a tsunami that will cross that a tsunami is like bitch please and they were like okay what if flooding happens because again that's how it's designed you have one line of defense uh, and then what happens after that line fails what happens second line defense third line you you always supposed to have multi multiple layers of redundancy so japanese redundancy was like a tiny wall that was not uh, that was instead of layer 1 defense it was layer 0 and uh, all the backup generators supposed to be spread out meaning you supposed to have few generators in the basement few generator on top of the buildings few in the surface level so in case of some bad events where a uh, hurricane or typhoon destroys something on top okay basement one is safe if something uh, destroys the basement and the surface level top layer would be safe uh, they put all of them on the background okay nothing bad will happen yeah it got flooded no more energy no more energy to pump water in the reactor itself and reactor slowly brick by brick that's why you may have paid attention to it, it was like okay one event happened okay now we have second boom then we have third boom yeah that's why it was happening so this created a very serious reality bitch slap to us it's like first we had poor communication then we had e- ego and uh, what you call uh, basically cost cutting but when this happened 2011 this was a stark reminder is that we just are not good enough where we can make a system that is absolutely robust in a fair is like oops event does not happen and let's not even talk about the cost of cleanups and all that because yes dear all the profit all the energy save one event destroys it all one event to give you a context this puppy had a suffocus built into it and that suffocus was built so poorly or maybe it got damaged by radiation it was starting to crack so european union had to chip in put boat load of money as in 1.5 billion euro to create a second suffocus that is even bigger that's the world's largest moving structure and then to contain it that was done if i'm not mistaken in 2016 we are still spending money on this and here again they had like water and they're like okay water in neutron source becomes radioactive water yeah that water first they thought we can just going to collect it and then slowly they realized yeah they they cannot connect it then they had to release it to the sea that became another hassle just recently so it's one of those things where uh, we realized very early on uh, in this event it's like nobody can close their eye and be like okay we got this you cannot do that with nuclear now because of this event again nuclear industry got a very harsh wake up and every uh, power plant went double in price simply because again lot of re- work was done especially plants that are next to seas lot of security checks double triple visits everything was done price went low and many plants this is the time many uh, plants were killed under construction they were like yeah if we add this cost uh, of like security upgrades yeah it will not be profitable so that happened so here's the can we make a nuclear power plant that is safe absolutely can we make it cheap no and power plant has to be cheap i'll explain this further uh, but that's the core reason can you make it cheap yes can you make it safe yes you cannot do it both either it will be safe and expensive or it will be cheap and unsafe and given the penalty of unsafe reactor we have learned the hard way no either you do not do it or you uh, bite down the price so that happened so and not to mention uh, another recurring cost of nuclear power plants is training proper training most of them could have been solved if they had proper training and that training is expensive so this is what history teaches us with three big bitch slap two of them really significant slap so what is the paradox here paradox is very simple the dream in 1954 that was from robert downey junior again those who watched oppenheimer understand this atomic energy commission uh, robert downey junior literally said this is that too cheap to be meter that was the dream that was the optimistic era because they had just split the atom and e equal to mc square on paper on real mathematical grounds it's absolutely got tier it's like do not worry about power that's how much power it has that is factually true however as time progressed as uh, people uh, started to smoking too much uh, basically nuclear energy they, i'm not joking there was a time they were like what if we have to make a tunnel right not even tunnel, like a canal and they're like instead of like you know going dynamiting which takes too much work, what if we ask uh, nukes to do the job boom 
they were actually experimented with this and uh, then we realized very early on that we did not understood neutrons enough yes dear take people uh, who have cleared uh, class 12 and just ask them uh, name the four types of radiation surprisingly lot of them will only able to mention three types alpha beta and gamma most of them will not be able to tell neutron and then ask them what actually neutron does that neutron activation what does that inherently mean even a simple example like water which you have to understand uh, is that yeah water has hydrogen hydrogen has a basic state and then it has hot states basically uh, deuterium and tritium those are radioactive they becomes dangerous and if it is ingested your skin can stop the radiation but if it's a water contamination and you drink that water you're dead if it goes inside you alpha and beta sources inside you you're dead and uh, that's just with that and uh, with carbon like graphite yeah that poppy becomes ludicrously radioactive so that happens from neutron and we started to understand that slowly as we started to experiment both with nukes more uh, like blood loss more issues then more we're like yeah this is not as safe as we thought this is not as just like ah it's just a stuff no no it's not just like nuclear waste fuel that you have to manage you have to also manage uh, the reactor itself the graphite itself all of those are idiotically radioactive so we realized very early on like as in around 1970s and 80s we figured out yeah this is not as easy as we thought so that time we understood that um, this is not easy and then we come to the real reality of engineering complexity is the enemy of reliability if you need multiple layers of redundancy to make sure that something bad does not happen so sooner or later something bad will happen and again fukushima was that sooner or later event so that's an absolute fact if too many things has to go right in order to be safe something bad will happen so fundamentally we realized very early on like around 1980s people were like yeah this is just not worth it uh, because again at that time enough stockpile of uh, waste started to happen that it's like okay what we have to deal with this also can we deal with this absolutely it's a known problem we can handle it just deal it's just not free i have no idea how the heck everybody assumes nuclear would be cheap it's like oh we're just gonna like put it inside a rock it's like yeah you have to take that rock you have to study that rock you have to make sure that there is no water source in that rock there are very few places that have that surprisingly so and then you have to uh, dig it out it's not cheap and to give you another context like spent fuel requires two years in cooling pool you have to cool it for two years oh by the way that was uh, that was the first boom in the fukushima plant uh, why did it went boom we, apparently if i'm not mistaken there was some alloy that uh, with the radiation environment water split into hydrogen and oxygen so that's one of those things so many layers of things have to make sure you have to make sure the reactor after you have turned it off has a heat dumping system cooling pond should also have cooling dumping system it's like yeah you cannot turn off a reactor plant like flat out if you have a nuclear power plant it cannot go off there is no state where it's like okay off it will become boom event if you turn it off so we have realized very early on it's like as a reactor not as a like a you know lab study was like oh it automatically turns off it's designed for that i'm talking a power plant like yeah no it's not designed for that so and safety is an ongoing expenditure can you have a safe nuclear reactor absolutely can you have it for cheap no that's the one core element that i always see missing in the every single discussion was like nuclear waste always like you cannot afford it it will bankrupt the country that tries it and here's the radioactive waste management like everyone's like what are we gonna do jeep do uh, geothermal drilling and then we're gonna bury it can that be done first you have to figure out what is the water table there because if water touches that, yeah, you're dead. So you have to make sure that there is no water there. Trust me, there are very few places that can meet that criteria. And even if you're like, okay, we're gonna in case it's so a water is not an issue, okay, awesome. Can you do it for free? No. Look into the price of the bore wells that is required for drilling that. It's expensive AF. This expensive AF, expensive AF, and that's the whole point. We simply cannot afford this like no matter what you do that whole uh, newspaper from 1950s uh, we enter a new era the atomic age that no longer holds true we have learned this the hard way that more time we spent the more we realize yeah it's one of those things where it's like on paper it looks cheap then you're like okay now we have to buy this then we have to buy this it's like a white elephant project we have learned it the hard way that safety is a super expensive thing waste management can we safely do it absolutely can we do it for cheaply hell no so these two things you have to ignore one or the other only then you will uh, say nuclear 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 it's like can you pay for it the answer harsh reality no so that's the paradox of it we did not knew enough where it was like like for example if you looked into uh, my uh, last video where i was talking about india's sodium based fast breeder reactor they knew that, uh, that because that reactor is designed as a breeder we are supposed to pull things out of it uh, it was designed with four 
passive cooling system that after you have uh, introduced a coolant uh, basically after you have shut down the reactor quote unquote controller or have been inserted you have shut down the reaction then it will still require like 30 days of cooling so they have passive system meaning no electricity it will still physically able to dump uh, the super hot sodium to a sodium to air heat exchanger and then you're gonna dump like even india's hot weather is like only 60 degrees celsius air and you're talking about like 400 to 500 degrees celsius uh, sodium is gonna dump enough heat that it can easily cool itself off like 8 megawatt of thermal heat can be dumped off by one setup four of them are there so we that's what we have learned like can we do it absolutely can we do it cheaply no so that's the paradox of it that's why every time you have been hearing the same thing and it's never done that's the same point it's like nobody can afford it so why can't we afford it well this is where things uh, start to become like uh, actually clear it's like the competition has changed. The world has changed a lot from 70s. It's not 1970s anymore. So to give you a context, solar energy, I'm talking about the total unit energy that it actually produced, not it could, produced, went into the grid, measured. 1300 terawatt hour. That is a bonkersly large number. Now here's the even larger number. That is wind. 2100 terawatt hour. To give you a context of nuclear, at this same year, year 2022, annual concern, 2487 now here still i'm not comparing the price because one would appear free solar will appear free wind will expect a bit more expensive nuclear will be like why the heck country is doing that and that's the whole point nuclear has a growing cost every year we have to keep increasing its cost as in like the kilowatt that you are buying for the grid is becoming more expensive solar a government can install it get roi as in like oh i took out a loan from a central government for this done sir in five to six years or sometimes eight in india we have very quick roi again if you are in uh, higher latitudes it would be different so i do expect canada to be different but in case of india we get it very quickly so your roi would be done and the panel life could be like let's say 20 years you're done like first 10 years you pay off your debt 10 years of profit is there nuclear all of them all of them are behind schedule all of them are double price meaning the actual calculation that was done that we call levelized cost of energy by which government decides a tariff for it where it's like okay we're gonna buy this much energy for you for this price yeah that price is lol because you double spent it and inflation you added it, it's like yeah no it's just bankruptcy it's basically you are running on bankruptcy at that point in time so that is why because of innovation of solar and wind is slowly reaching a point where even france is like yeah we really have to go to wind because again it sounds awesome on paper where it's like nuclear when you actually compare it to what is available now not in 70s now it changes the equation and by the way the reason i'm comparing it 22 23 24 data is almost being cooked right now so and almost all data sets so, so there's at least 30 percent growth in both of them so yeah it have crossed that point so with real world real data that is from year 2000 we know for a fact that uh, current growth of solar and wind is so exponential so fast so quick and we have enough space okay we have enough space and what especially once we start to go with offshore wind farm more than enough oomph is there that it will become the world's bulk power provider now history if you are old enough you must have remember in early 2000s to 2005 in that sort of era everybody was talking about solar and wind but nobody was taking it seriously because everybody was like yeah it cannot provide enough power now nobody talks like that why we have national level power by the way look, uh, india's solar output is enough where it can handle directly few of the smaller countries directly just on solar directly so that's there and again once you have solar and wind you do not even have to worry about intermittencies because we are so good nowadays again we have been trying this for 20 years uh, that we are actually good at predicting so we can predict solar output and wind output quite reliably and you have hydro let's say in case of india we have a lot of hydro you can like literally balance the grid india is really not putting a lot of money into wind farm but again i, I have a feeling we're gonna go there once we start to reach a taper point of solar we're gonna go there so flat out we have reached that and what does this mean that simply means we're gonna have so much surplus energy at certain points that grid storage becomes viable now when was the first time humanity actually looked into grid energy storage again in 70s why nuclear plants because we realized very early on that nuclear plants cannot be off state there cannot be low power state so it, if it's a 1500 megawatt plant it has to produce 1500 megawatts okay you can turn it off in this and that but it's like no 1500 megawatt most of the time so what do you do well you have to either build way too many of it uh, to provide uh, base load power or you can build minimum and then during night time you charge pumped hydro 
and during night you charge from that during daytime when you have peak which exceeds what your uh, nuclear can do then you discharge it that way you do not need to overbuild the nuclear and you can safely handle the energy that's the first time we started to truly build pumped hydro so if you ever wondered why the heck we built pumped hydro in so long ago that was the reason that was the nuclear fever at that time <coughs> Sorry about that. So in that nuclear fever, we figured it out. That technology. And again, what is happening right now? Same thing. We have over energy future. We are we are getting energy. California is already reaching a point where one to two hours they do their energy surplus. It's like they have to turn it off. They can't do anything to it. So that is making a reality where grid storage is viable economically. Where it's like, hey, we're gonna buy cheap energy during the peak time, sell it during the night time. We have been doing this from 1970s, so we know it works and it does not destabilize the grid. We have experience with that. So more and more people are looking into it. And the, as uh, grid becomes more efficient, more powerful, more HVDC links, the less hassle we have to deal with. So this is happening right now. So no longer, the, oh, nuclear will provide. It's like, bro, we cross that threshold. We cross that threshold. Where it's like, and again, nuclear is always assuming that no oops event happens because one oops event, all the profit that you have got will be like, God. So same thing, nuclear safety cannot be cheap. Any Tom, Dick and Harry tells you, oh, nuclear safety, go to a hospital near you, especially any large hospital that has a radiological department that deals with radioactive stuff. Ask them how much money they have to spend just to get the license for that. It's bonkersly high. And again, they have to be that cautious. They have to be that secure because there, uh, there is a scenario where you can have like oops event where it's like somebody left out some radioactive stuff and it caused havoc in society. It has happened. We have learned it the hard way. That's why it's so secure, so absolute. Nuclear power plant, even the small modular reactor, it would be expensive NAF. To be fair, Rolls-Royce people who are working on that, they were very clear on that. It's like only army can afford it. You need 24 hours security on that. So. Flat out. Now, here's the deal. If nuclear is so bad, how the heck army is doing it, right? That's a real world. Like, USA is build, going all in with nuclear. India is building nuclear power submarines. We have built one. And we're going to so, slowly uh, reach a point where we're going to build nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Why? Well, here's the deal. Army does not need to show ROI. Return on investment is not a requirement of them. It's almost a sunk uh, economical system. It's like, you create a budget, you expect all of the branches to pay back but you do not expect army to pay back. It's like, it's an insurance premium. We understand it. That's how we plan the budget for it. And again, for, uh, there, is there a benefit here which is priceless? Yes. For example, how much money will you pay to get your aircraft carrier from A to B? If you are using diesel-based system or a fuel oil-based system, you are expecting 40 uh, to 45 kilometer per hour speed. If you are expecting nuclear, you can touch 60 kilometer or 65 kilometer per hour. What is that advantage worth in a warfare? Short answer, priceless. Shut up, take money. That's why they get shut up, take money. $13 billion for an aircraft carrier. That's the whole point of it, super carriers. And again, India is surrounded by two naughty nations. One, we have China. Another, we have Pakistan. We have to have a powerful navy that can handle these two puppies. So we need to invest in it. That's why I am very happy that India is investing in core technology of the nuclear so we can develop whole thing, whole supply chain from start to finish on our own. But if Indian government says, we're going to use this to power the country, yeah, we're going to starve to death. So flat out, power plant has to show return on investment. It cannot be just like, oh, we take out billions of dollars from central reservoir and then we charge even more. Like that's, there is a reason I'm not talking about power plant prices. It's stupidly bonkers. And uh, once you, if you do fail to pay the profit, which again, if you double the price, the what we call allocated cost is lol, flat out. It will become a debt on government, which again, almost every country is realizing right now. For example, in 2022, this year, uh, there was a serious drought. Almost every country suffered from it. Uh, France suffered a very weirdly for it. Why? Yeah, they realized that uh, nuclear power plants drink river and they already had a drought condition. They had to throttle all their nuclear power plants. If they didn't, they would have boiled the rivers away or whatever remaining was there. So they had to throttle in peak loading time. So we are learning the hard way that nuclear on paper sounds awesome. When you actually do it, it's like, oh, 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 okay, okay, I have to spend this, and I have to spend this, and I have to be dependent on this, and then I have to do this. Yeah, that's the reason why it's never, ever cheap. So if anybody sells you a weed where it's like, oh, it's cheap, slap them. Because this, there is a priceless aspect to it. That's why people will pay for it, willingly, knowingly. Power plant is not that. Power plant has to be a for-profit instrumentation. This is for-profit. Five years of ROI is done, it's achieved. Achieved, done, take it and go home. Right now, India has many gigawatt scale solar farms and many more under commissioning. China is also going YOLO on it. 
so europe is going uh, yolo on offshore wind farm that's the primary reason is cheaper is cheaper than coal is cheaper than well, any other source so and practically you can scale it up we know for mathematical reality right now that we can keep scaling it up and there's a lot of technology that is under the construction right now once they start to even quicker rois will start to happen in nuclear even more price will happen so this, i have no idea it's like are oh, we going to have insert the control rod it's like that's half of the battle after you have inserted the control rod you have to cool it and that requires energy lot of energy or unless you like you're dealing with sodium where the sodium itself is so hot that it can have a convection motion to air where it can dump it water cannot do that so if it's a water based reactor i do not seen i have not seen any design that is passively cool enough so to say so that's the competition reality of it is like can we do it for boom boom devices absolutely can we do it for energy no our world consumes way too much and way too quickly uh, that this works solar works people are putting solar on their home it is that good like we used to dream in 1960s where we're going to have like a nuclear reactor in everybody's house we have it it's called solar that's today so what about the wisdom aspect of it here's deal we had the same sort of fever dream with hydropower if you are old enough you must have remembered there was a craze of hydropower it's like it's every school textbook talks about hydro dams as like they do not have consequences only pros no consequences but here's deal time bitch slapped us hard we learned it the hard way like here's deal when we were building dams we knew that dams will dry out rivers we were not taking it seriously it's one of those things like engineer gave us like it's going to dry out a river 10% annually who cares because again 10% annually does not mean that much but after 30 years that means your rivers is like whoa whoa what do you mean the power plant i built based on this river disappeared yeah that's happened we are at that stage right now that's why you do not talk here people talking about let's build more mega dams there was a craze for it three quarter stem and all that and reality is very serious again um, china went all in they went in all on basically building a lot of uh, dams and the output was even their own hydrologists to warn them do not build this many dams they're like we're going to build dam we're going to have renewable energy no no in year 2022 it became the first year in their thousands of years of recorded history when yanzi river dried out that's the first time in their thousand and they are very proud of that they have unbroken history of thousands of year and this is the first time they have to actually write down yeah the river dried out because again every engineer warned them like it will dry out the more dams you will it will dry out same thing and it's very hard to explain it to people especially if they have studied the wrong detail in school where it's like dam has no consequences like it has to be taught in the school where it's like if you build a dam it will increase the evaporation once you increase the evaporation not only the downstream will dry out the upstream also dries out so over time ah what happened to the water disappeared what happened to the water disappeared so and you're going to be relying on home uh, weird monsoons to handle it so we have learned this the hard way that our short sightedness on the dam projects had a penalty and we are paying that penalty right now so we have to learn this where is like i'm saying european we're going to do deep geological uh, you know storage of the nuclear waste awesome who is paying for this is it who is paying for this drilling down is expensive drilling vertically is ludicrous way building chambers down deep yeah that's super expensive i'm not to mention you have to do this in an area where you have no water water table cannot touch these sort of things so and you may like what if you have encasement yeah water is one of those things that cuts through mountain so you do not want to have water so only few places can do that and then you are just going to like oh i'm going to take out billion dollar loans for government for money uh, for what boom boom devices it makes sense it's an insurance premium but when you're talking about energy it's like uh, why didn't you do solar why didn't you do hvdc interconnect that's why you pay attention to europe right now they are building so many hvdc interconnects because they realize that's the easiest way to solve the intermissy problem right now they are going from one continent to another continent and they're like yeah that will solve all our problem and what about the roi on that it's in months hvdc interconnects are that efficient right now so is it a great technology nuclear absolutely for warfare if you are like super carriers go but for cheap and abundant power it's neither cheap nor abundant why again small modular reactor sounds very good until you realize this is the dumbest way to get energy out of it because you are wasting uh, basically energy wise you have to deal with shielding right it's a neutron emission shielding shielding makes sense if you have one large unit why because surface area to volume ratio is in your side so per megawatt how much concrete you have to pour down goes down but if you have this design per megawatt it goes up ludicrously so you gonna and not to mention the temperature also goes down so let's say this will barely reach 250 degrees celsius pressurized water temperature where if you had all of the same thing less material will be consumed you can reach 350 degrees celsius 
again it's a fundamental like imagine a heating element separated out on a water bath versus all the same amount of heating element put in a centralized place with giant thick insulation there is a reason we do not do this it's like again if army says hey we need a nuclear power plant that is small modular we need to put it on a mountain top we're gonna maintain the security of it and all that awesome again we trust them with boom devices that can literally remove the planet from habitable status uh, we can trust them with minor inconveniences but again, as a like power plant, no, 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 just no, flat out. That's the whole point. It's neither cheap nor abundant. The moment you're like, okay, now build a gigawatt scale nuclear power plant, you look at the price, you're like, yeah, that's not happening. You will learn very quickly why this will not scale up to gigawatts. Sounds very good. It's just like until you actually do it, it's like, oh, that's why we don't do it. And money has to have ROI, especially for power plants. Like again, even from a government's point of view, there is a book, there is a balance. And if you just go YOLO like China did, it becomes inflation for the future generation. And if you ever wondered why the heck food is getting expensive in countries like India, yeah, you cannot just keep burning money like there is no tomorrow. There is a penalty for it. So we have to learn from our mistake where we like we are going all orgasmic on hydro power and then we realized, yeah, that's the worst idea because again, again, most of the dams are not being demolished yet. So we only have 30 years left. Majority of rivers will be gone by then. Oh, 2022 gave us a like a, a gentle bit slap. Uh, wait for 2045. That will be a strong bit slap. So either we learn from it or we just like, oh, what if we take more loans to drill this and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. And it's like, and then our ch children would be like, uh, why the heck food cost $5,000? So that's the whole point. If building this, we expect there is no return on investment. If you are building a power plant, that's not the case. And you cannot build neutron source for cheap. Again, safety alone would be expensive as hell. Retraining alone would be expensive. Hell. I'm not even touching the metals, the, con the technology that is needed to build all those things. So that's the wisdom aspect of it. So this was my presentation on what is the core paradox of nuclear energy. Hopefully you have liked it, learn from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it amongst a friend. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.